Okay, uh, our next speaker is going to talk about one of the most intriguing, confusing things uh, around called quantum me mechanical entanglement. Uh, Itmar Kimchi is, uh, started as a Popolardo Fellow in, in 2015 in hard condensed matter theory. Um, I'll just mention while he's setting up that uh, I started about the same time as our, our dean, Michael Sipser, who's a mathematician, and one of our early cases that I had to take to him was in the area of hard condensed matter theory. And, and Michael said, well, tell me, is there easy condensed matter theory? <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, you know, part of educating a dean. So uh, <laughs> Itmar Kimchi. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I was here as an undergrad, so uh, you know, I really feel uh, the honor of, uh, of being here as a Papalado Fellow uh, and, and speaking to everyone here. Um, uh, and uh, so I do hard condensed matter theory, and I don't know if it's any harder than soft. I think both are equally hard. Uh, but this does uh, allow me to put quantum in titles of my talk. So I'll be talking about uh, quantum mechanics, quantum entangled matter, so by matter, I mean not only that it matters, you should care about it, but also uh, it's like a piece of matter, yeah? So we're gonna be talking about like a piece of solid that you could imagine holding in your hand. As a theorist, uh, I'm gonna talk, talk about this. So uh, let's go back to the basics of quantum entanglement, uh, like what you learned in kindergarten, right? Uh, Schrodinger's cat. So uh, we know that in the famous thought experiment, if you think of Schrodinger's cat as alive and dead at the same time, quantum superposition, uh, that's not how it works in reality. If you try to make that quantum superposition of all of the material, all of the many particles that make up this cat that you can hold in your hands, you can't make them into a superposition uh, of this straightforward alive plus dead. So what we want to ask, right, is can we have a real kind of quantum entangled state of all the particles in a cat or in a material uh, that, that's really quantum entangled, that's not going to collapse into one of them. And another way to phrase this is uh, we're looking for phases of matter that are beyond symmetry breaking. Uh, that's the buzzword. So symmetry breaking uh, is the... Uh, uh, you know, concept uh, prevalent throughout physics, in high energy physics. Um, uh, and so we know examples of symmetry broken states of matter. These are all the examples we're familiar with. Uh, they fall into this category. Like if you freeze water into ice, that's kind of symmetry breaking, or even like a magnet, like iron, and even a superconductor. So that's very quantum, but still a kind of symmetry breaking. And now we want to ask the question, can you even imagine entanglement between all the electrons, all the atoms in a material that's beyond this? You know, so in the Schrodinger cat, let's go back to the cat, uh, symmetry breaking would be like it collapses to alive or dead. And we want to get some kind of entangled state between everything so that it remains in this delicate dance of entanglement. Uh, so I'm a theorist, so I want to look both at the theoretical aspects of this question, like is this possible mathematically? That the answer is known to be yes. Uh, and one of the things we're working on is expanding on that yes, you know, how is that possible? But what I want to tell you about today is not just uh, the purely theoretical part, but how to connect these theoretical concepts to experiments. So to ask this question, but be able to find concepts that you can relate to experiments. Can you have this entanglement between many particles? Okay, so one uh, known experimental example is this fractional quantum Hall effect that maybe you might have heard of. So uh, quantum Hall effect means take this 2D system, put it in a very strong magnetic field, and uh, uh, what you find if it's sufficiently clean with particular magnetic field values, et cetera, um, is, uh, quoting from the Nobel Prize citation, it's a quantum fluid with fractionally charged excitations. So you have a system of electrons, of course, everything is just electrons with charge E, but because they get entangled, one way in which you can see the entanglement, you know, some manifestation, the entanglement you know is crazy quantum phenomena, 
So you know that there should be some crazy manifestation of the crazy quantum phenomena. One manifestation here is that the excitations have charge a fraction of the electron charge, like one third. And that's not even the craziest thing. So even crazier, too crazy for the Nobel Prize citation, evidently, the statistics here are also fractional. So uh, you know we have bosons and fermions, and fermions are defined by if you exchange two of them, you get a minus sign, or you need more exchanges to get back to the original state. Here you need even more exchanges, some extra triple number of exchanges, windings of two particles to get back to the original state. So we know that entanglement, you know, we can see experimentally that it's not just kind of inherently interesting, it can also give some very strange physics. Okay, but this example is a very, you know, particular experimental system. This kind of uh, 2D, very special clean system with very high magnetic field. It's not the same thing as like having a material that you're holding in your hands. So let's ask, uh, can we have a collective entangled state of matter like we saw experimentally in the qu fractional quantum hall, but now with electrons in a piece of solid, you know, as straightforward as can be. And um, here, uh, the kind of context, the kind of solids we should look at, uh, it turns out one promising avenue is magnetic insulators. Then it's also easier to think about it uh, because the electrons, you know, they have charge, but they're just sitting in place, but they also have spin. So then we need to look at what the electron spin is doing. That's the thing that'll get entangled. And uh, the buzzword here is quantum spin liquid. So that's the name theorists have given to this kind of state. And maybe, you know, there's hints that maybe it's seen in some experiments, uh, but it's not very clear, partially because to try to look at entanglement is very tough. You can't see it directly. And here again, theoretically, we expect very strange things. We have bosons, the spins are bosons. But out of these bosons from entanglement, we expect to get fermions. Okay, good. So let's now take a step back from this entanglement story and go look at some spin systems just to get like the general context here. So uh, what happens in a spin system? Imagine like a 1D system here, just an array of spin. And typically what you see is they arrange into this kind of pattern, like alternating up, down, up, down. Uh, and often you have maybe a square lattice, like in a copper oxide superconductors we'll hear about later, and you still get this kind of alternating pattern. You know, an upspin has neighbors which point down. So that's typical. Okay, but then you can ask, this is a square lattice, but we can look at lots of different solids. What about materials that have triangles instead of squares, right? You might have a two of them pointing one up and then one down, but then you have a third neighbor, what is it gonna do? It doesn't know what to do. So, you know, here by drawing arrows, I'm talking about classical states, not quantum entanglement. But the fact that it doesn't know what to do, there's different classical states, that's a chance for quantum mechanics to kick in and give you entanglement. And that's familiar in a different context, just molecules, not a whole solid, but just a tiny molecule like benzene, there's these two different uh, configurations of benzene competing classical states that we know resonate with quantum mechanics and give you some kind of uh, superposition of the two of them. Now we have a whole solid, like a whole solid made of these triangles. So the kind of entangled state we want, you know, we can't even draw it. I'm not allowed to draw spins to show you an entangled state. So even picturing it is tough. But at least we know, you know, maybe this is one route for uh, going there. But it turns out, you know, if you just look at this kind of triangular lattice with a typical interaction, that's not enough. Uh, what you get is still a classical state in numerics or in materials that are, this is an appropriate model. Uh, so what you get is this kind of configuration. Let me walk you through how to interpret it so that I can contrast this with what we'll see later on. So uh, look at the center row. And you can see we start with an up, and as you go to the right, you go clockwise and clockwise, they keep rotating. And same thing with the other rows, right? So everything's rotating in the same way, some spiral rotating clockwise. Okay, 
So that's the context. So now let me tell you about uh, these new materials that, as a theorist, I collaborated on working both in the understanding the experimental data uh, and some uh, more theoretically removed things. So these are some iridium oxide materials. They look like this. They're magnetic insulators. It's the right thing to look at. And there's two new things here. One is special relativity. And that comes in because iridium is heavy. It has a large atomic number. The electrons move very fast around this highly charged nucleus, and you get some special relativity effects. Uh, they go by the name spin-orbit coupling. And another thing is that these materials have very strange new lattices, like this one. Very strange. OK, so let me tell you, you know, about the materials and then pulling back uh, to entanglement. So for the materials, these are the kind of lattices. Actually, the same chemical formula gives you three different materials here, at least three. So they come in three stable lattices, chemically, when they make them. Uh, I can call them alpha and beta and gamma. And they all kind of look like a honeycomb lattice with hexagons, uh, but some 3D versions of the honeycomb. So we have these hexagons, and you know, we know what hexagons should do, like a spin system on a hexagon, you expect would have this kind of alternating up, down, up, down, just alternating. That's what you expect, but it's not what we get here. So experimentally, people have studied these materials, and instead they get this very strange order. So you can immediately tell there's something funny going on here. Right? It looks pretty frustrated. And it's even worse. So this is looking at just the spins in the plane of the board, and they even point a little bit out of the board. It's crazy complicated. And all three of these materials have the same kind of analogous complicated state. Two of them even really exactly the same state. OK, so how do we even start to make sense of this? So uh, let's just look at the black part. And uh, you can see that these two rows kind of have repeating elements from the first two rows. So it's enough to just look at the first two rows, just this kind of zigzag chain. OK, so let's look at it and zoom in. And we have this detective mystery for this first part, understanding the materials. You know, what's the pattern here? Can we make sense of this? So let's do what we did earlier. Look at the bottom row and go from left to right, and we see they rotate clockwise. And now look at the top row and go from left to right. And from left to right, they rotate counterclockwise, the other way. So that's crazy. And another way to say this is, you know, do the spins want to be aligned or anti-aligned with their neighbors? What's the kind of interaction here? OK, sometimes they want to point the same way, but sometimes they want to point basically opposite ways. And on average, it's exactly zero. So that's the wrong approach. And these two things are connected to each other, this feature. And that tells us there's something really weird going on, something different. And, uh, what saves the day here will turn out to be special relativity. Because the way you usually get the interaction that tells them to point anti-aligned with their neighbors, alternating up, down, you can do some kind of chemistry arguments. And here, because of special relativity, th those cancel out exactly. You get complete destructive interference. And many possibilities uh, could arise instead. And one of these possibilities is this one. Uh, of having kind of different interaction axes for different bonds spatially, uh, which goes by the buzzword Kitaev. Uh, the reason for that buzzword, that's someone's name. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give credit to uh, Alexei Kitaev, who came up as a theorist with this really crazy theoretical model that looks totally crazy, imagining these kind of spin interactions on a lattice of hexagons. And it's a really th crazy model, but what's nice about it is that it's frustrated, and you can actually see what it does, even though it's frustrated. You can solve it and see that you get this kind of quantum spin liquid, this entanglement. So you get, and you can really see mathematically how you get fermions from bosons in Kitaev's model. And it turns out, if you try to write a similar model now for these 3D lattices, you can do that, and the same thing works. You can get this kind of fermions from bosons with entanglement from the frustration. OK, so is this right? So let me help you walk through seeing the relation, uh, you know, why these Kitaev interactions are the right thing for solving the puzzle here. OK, so to walk you through, I need, uh, I need everyone to tilt their head 45 degrees. So let me be easy on you. <laughs> I'll just tilt the screen 45 degrees. OK, so tilting the screen 45 degrees, that's that zigzag chain. 
and there is spin axes x and y. And x axis is associated with the vertical bond, and y axis is associated with the horizontal bond. So let me walk you through seeing the pattern here. So let's look at the vertical bond. When the spins on the vertical bond are horizontal, when they're along this x-axis, they're aligned with each other. And when they're vertical, when they're along the y-axis, perpendicular to x, they're anti-aligned. They point in opposite directions. Right? So here they're in the same direction when they're along x and opposite directions when they're along y. And the analogous thing happens for these y bonds, right? They're in the same direction when they're along y and opposite directions when they're along x. So it's a really complicated pattern, but that's the right pattern here. And uh, that's associated with this kind of counter rotation of clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay, so that tells us, even just transparently by eye, that the right model for this material has to have this crazy kind of special relativity induced uh, Kitaev interactions, as well as some other things, because it's not a spin liquid. I'm actually allowed to draw spins here. So at the end of the day, you get a classical state, but a very strange, totally new classical state. Okay, so let me just briefly, in the last maybe two minutes, tell you, uh, just summarize the kind of uh, uh, approaches that we've done to tackle this problem. Uh, so there's three approaches. So one is uh, to study the materials in some more mathematical detail. Uh, we studied, in particular, some other interactions to add to these ones, and looked at the phase diagram means, uh, you know, computed in some approximation what a model would give you. And some models give you this kind of magnet called stripey, and some models give you this kind of ferromagnet like iron. But some other models in between stripey and ferromagnet, these other models exactly give you what's seen in the materials this very strange kind of magnetic order. So that's good, that tells us about the materials. Another theoretical approach is to go to this part of the phase diagram, like just the Kitaev model, but now in the three dimensions, and understand how to picture entanglement, and what would entanglement, this kind of entangled state, look like physically. So that's some cartoon. It turns out you can't draw arrows, but one thing you can draw is loops to see how the fermions come out of the bosons from entanglement. And let me show you just two more slides about another approach, which is tuning into the spin liquid from the magnet. So this other approach, uh, uh, to understand you know, why we need it, uh, let's pull back. You know, why is this a hard problem? We have quantum mechanics and frustration with these complicated 3D lattices. And that means that it's impossible to solve. Strictly impossible. So even if you had the solution, just writing it down, would be billions of terabytes. You know, th that's meaningless. You can't solve the problem directly. So you can do different approximations, like an approximation appropriate for the materials, which luckily we can do because the materials have magnetic order, an approximation that's good for uh, just the spin liquid. And another approximation we did is a kind of uh, theory land approximation. You know, go to infinite dimensions for the experts. It's a tree or the basal lattice. Uh, and actually, this approximation was suggested by uh, a paper by MIT people uh, a while ago. So we're using this approach, uh, this kind of algorithm, on the infinite dimensional tree. Uh, and it kind of makes sense here because the lattices of the materials have very big loops. So it's like we're taking this loop size to infinity. So it's just a tree. And that allows us to run an algorithm to do this kind of theory land approach. And I'll show you one plot from this approach, uh, you tune some parameter of the model, and we can measure lots of things. We can measure the magnetism of the stripy antiferromagnet, and we see the state, and then it goes to zero. Measure the magnetism of this ferromagnet, and we see the magnetization, and then it goes to zero. And in between, there is a spin liquid, which we can see from directly from the entanglement in this algorithm, we have direct access to the entanglement of the spin liquid. Uh, and it's very, very kind of good coincidence of things that allows us to see it uh, in this kind of uh, algorithm. It's, it's because it's both, uh, even though it's a tree, there's also an entanglement cutoff. So there's a lot of kind of technical things that come into being able to see this highly entangled state. But that allows us to really 
tune a parameter theoretically and see how to go from a magnet into this entangled, quantum entangled spin liquid. Okay, so as an outlook, right, how do we get to a spin liquid from the materials? There's two parts to the question. So one is how do you make it? We want to tune the interactions. And one nice way to do it here is just to change the kind of black magic that you do to make a crystal. Uh, or maybe even just apply some pressure to the crystal. That changes the geometry. And because of the thing, the kind of chemical derivation with special relativity, this interaction is very sensitive to the geometry. And another question is how do you see the entanglement? And again here we have some ideas for an answer. Uh, one, one, uh, one possible answer is connected to this three-dimensional spin liquid and the loops, which give you some signature at finite temperature. And another one, which is uh, an answer that you can never totally understand theoretically. It's one of these unsolvable things, but it's a, a motivation for experimentalists to try to do is to remove electrons from the material. And uh, one uh, kind of theoretically a good guess for what could happen is a very strange superconductor that comes out of the quantum entangled Schrodinger cat, but everything quantum entangled state. So uh, this kind of unconventional superconductor, if you'd like, could be another motivation. Okay, so let me thank my collaborators, you know, all the experimental collaborators I've worked with, and uh, my PhD advisor, Ashvin Veshwanath, who, of course, many of you know, he was probably uh, standing on this podium uh, giving a similar you know, related to Apollodo talk uh, some time ago. Uh, and finally, let me thank uh, Neil and Jane uh, for making, uh, you know, this whole research uh, possible. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. You guys consulting? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Joe Hornstein was my freshman roommate. Wow. <laughs> okay. Oh, that, I would love to hear. He's a character, so I would love to hear that. He's a great, uh, he's been a great, uh, I mean, not my official mentor, but the kind of informal mentor for me. Uh, I really appreciated his, you know, viewpoint for experiment and how to connect experiments to theory. Are there any unconventional? Uh, superconductors that you're aware of that might exhibit this? Yeah, right. So, th so that's a great question. So the reason people started really putting effort into studying these spin liquid states, these quantum entangled states, one of the original motivations was that they did experiments on the cuprates, the copper oxide materials that Ina Vishik will talk about. And they were very unconventional. And they thought maybe quantum entanglement will help explain them. It turns out that, you know, it could. It could, yeah. So, work to be done to prove that it could. exactly, exactly. So we know that it could, but whether that's the right explanation for these un for the unconventional superconductors, that we need more work. But they're very well. So there are some, uh, you know, other other ones that have been uh, observed. There's also some uh, organic materials, actually. Uh, that are, uh, I think, very intimately related to both superconductivity and this, these kinds of spin liquids. Um, uh, and the nice thing for these materials is that, uh, you know, we understand what's going on so much better because of the very strange magnetism that allows us to really nail down what's going on in the material. So maybe that'll be an approach to, uh, you know, to having a kind of more robust explanation later on. So I have a question. But magnetism normally yeah. disrupts superconductivity. That's right. And would that interfere, therefore, strongly with? That's right. So that's actually another way to say um, why the superconductor would be unconventional. So uh, if you took this magnet, theoretically, there is some kind of expectation that if you could take electrons out of this kind of very strange magnet of these materials, that taking the electrons out, as you start making superconductivity, would itself get rid of the magnetism. You know, it's like turning what you said exactly, you know, looking at it from the other direction. Taking the electrons out to disrupt the magnetism and then allow this unconventional superconductivity to set in. So the, the mean old professor at Berkeley yeah. who taught me fluid mechanics, yeah. 
told us that a fluid is a substance that assumes the shape of its container that has a gravitational free surface. <laughs> so how does that square with a spin fluid? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's right. So, I mean, I think all of, you know, understanding in physics is always about metaphors. <laughs> Taking one, uh, one, you know, and yeah. I think that's true. Like, that's what yeah. understanding means. It's, you yeah. know, using words for which we have intuition and finding yeah. ways to apply no, that's them. That's why I'm asking and, the question. Uh, is. And I think, but I think the metaphor here, uh, you can only take part of the metaphor. <laughs> okay. So the metaphor here is uh, liquid as opposed to ice, where an ice would be like symmetry breaking, like yeah. the magnetism. And if you could melt the magnetism, melting ice would give you liquid. Melting the magnetism would give you this kind of soup. Spin liquid. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, some, something that could be ordered. OK, great. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. But in addition to the liquid part, there's also the entanglement. That's really the defining and And I'll just forget about right the here. gravitational free, free surface. No gravity in this talk. Yeah, that guy's probably dead anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, good. So there's, of course, no like definition of entanglement as a mathematical quantity for a state. Uh, you can define uh, uh, some entanglement entropy with a cut. Um, so indeed, I, I haven't defined it. But I mean, if you'd like the technical defini definition here, uh, I'm looking for an insulator, like a gapped state. Uh, that's still gapped states, meaning like uh, it's not a metal. It's uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, you know, things are still kind of stuck in some sense. Um, you can relax that, but you can imagine some limit where you can make them kind of stuck in place, but still they can talk to each other and be entangled even across long distances. So that's the definition, a kind of long range entanglement where things are entangled, you know, even one electron in this corner of the system and another electron all the way in the other corner will still be entangled in a particular kind of long range way, uh, even though it's a ground state that's where they're stuck in place. So that's the definition. Okay, let's thank Itamari again. <laughs>